Fantastic. So I am really happy to be uh, introducing Dave Gao, who is the, Dave, what's your title? Oh, gosh. Global, Global Lead <laughs> Data and Technology Scientist. <laughs> Something at like World that. Wildlife Fund. <laughs> yeah, WWF. It's a, very, it's a very long, and I can't ever quite remember it title, but um, essentially what that means is he is um, a very high level person at WWF that's been thinking very deeply about some of the questions that we've all been thinking about at the summer school. How do you scale up our ability to monitor biodiversity? How do we think about making like data-driven conservation decisions? Um, what is the value of wildlife data? <laughs> um, and I'm sure he's, he's gonna cover you know, some of that in his talk, um, but I also asked him at the beginning, to give a little bit of an overview of his path to this interdisciplinary space because um, I think it's interesting. Um, yeah, so go ahead, Dave, and take it away. All right. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to um, talk to y'all and for sharing your time with me. I really, really appreciate it. And it's really awesome that you're in this, this program and good job, Sarah, for putting it together. Um, let's see, I'll share my screen. Let me know if it looks okay. Uh, where is this thing? How's that? Does that look okay? Great. All right. So yes. Okay. I am the global data and technology lead scientist, and I cannot remember that either. But apparently, it took a long time to get the title right. Uh, and I'm at the World Wildlife Fund, which in other countries is also called the Worldwide Fund for Nature, um, because although wildlife is very central to what we do, um, we also focus a lot on nature in general. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with computer vision at WWF. Um, but like Sarah said, um, she, wanted me a, she wanted me to give you a quick like overview of the strange circuitous path I took to get to where I am. Uh, I'm on the global science team at WWF. And apart from people in like IT who handle sort of networking, desktop support and all that kind of stuff, there aren't a lot of people who have um, engineering degrees. I, I only know of myself and one other person in the 7,000 or so people who work at WWF across the whole globe. Um, so it is an interdisciplinary space that I, I sit in, um, which makes it very uh, fun and interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And I got to it like a, in a strange way. So I started um, as a cognitive science major in, um, as an undergrad. And so I focused on psychology. I was looking at how people study, uh, how people learn and categorize. And to do that, I was doing a lot of modeling, like cognitive modeling. And I took a lot of computer science classes to do that. And then I went on to go for a PhD in experimental psychology, focusing on how people categorize. And one of the, one of the questions we were asking at that time was, do are humans built to categorize living things differently than they categorize non-living things? Is there something special about living things versus like squares and triangles and things like that? So I did some studies using mice and people categorizing mice versus squares, you know, <laughs> categories. And it was, you know, I was always interested in animals and nature and I do a lot of hiking and stuff like that. So this really appealed to me and the whole line of research was really fun. Um, but over time, I started realizing as I was taking more and more computer science classes that I really understood computers a lot better than I understood people. And that my <laughs> intuition about the way people would be doing things, despite me being one, were, was not very good. Um, and eventually I, you know, I was like ABD and enjoying the computer science stuff so much. I picked up a master's degree in computer science along the way. And I finally thought, uh, I'm just gonna do computer science. So then, let's see, I spent um, a, a while doing various computer science things in, in various jobs, um, all kinds of stuff. I worked with Mother Jones Magazine and Wired Magazine. I worked for a dividends and options trading company, um, just kind of all over the place. And uh, well, I started, I worked on a couple of startups and that all went fine until the dot-com bust around 2000 when myself and all of my friends were suddenly unemployed. And then I just like, what am I gonna do with my life? And I decided to stop doing all the silly stuff I was doing and devote it 
to science, but I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. And then I ran to this guy. His name is Jay Baldwin. He was a student of our Buckminster Fuller. He's kind of a hero of mine. And I was just at a conference. And he was there. And oh my God, Jay Baldwin. And I was just thinking about what am I going to do with my life? So I said, Jay Baldwin, you can tell me, what should I do with my life? <laughs> <laughs> and he said something, which was good. He, he said, you just go to as many things as these conferences as possible, talk to as many people as possible, go to as many meetups as you can, keep doing that until you find something that you think is really interesting and then do that thing, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's what I did. So I started going to a lot of meetups and talking to a lot of people. And finally, I ran to people working on this thing called the All Species Project, um, which was a, first a small NGO. It just started up. Um, and they were trying to accelerate the discovery of life on the planet, which really aligned with my other interests in biodiversity in general that I had always as a kid growing up. Um, and, and they needed an engineer. They didn't know they needed an engineer at the time, but I talked to them for a while and convinced them that they needed an engineer. And so they hired me and I did some, some work for them and it was really interesting and it introduced me to a lot, a lot of people and really got me into this kind of intersection of computer science and, and biodiversity. Um, the, and it was also, well, I worked for Mother, Mother Jones Magazine is kind of an NGO, but All Species was the first NGO. So I went from sort of academia to, I did a bunch of business stuff. Then I went to this NGO. Um, it, didn't, it didn't get additional funding, but in the year that I was there, I met a lot of people and was able to do lots of different projects afterwards. Oh, and if you heard about the black-footed ferret clone, um, the people who started all species then started a thing called Revive and Restore, and they cloned the black-footed, endangered black-footed ferret um, named uh, Marie Ann, I think, and Marie. Uh, so one of the things I worked on was AntWeb. Um, AntWeb is like social media for ant experts. All the ant experts in the world go to AntWeb and they share their information about ants. And one of the great things about this project other than meeting a bunch of ant people who are super nice and social like their species of interest um, <laughs> was, yeah. oh, i also anybody who programs in java i used ant you know to compile all the code for ant uh, there's a lot of good ant stuff um i, I had like hundreds of thousands of ant observations in this database uh, and for google earth was just being created or just was just launched and we had the great idea of trying to map out where all the ants were so i made this humongous kml file and uploaded it to to google, to google earth and it completely destroyed it in many different ways so like they just couldn't <laughs> handle hundreds of thousands of ants often because a lot of the ants were like right on top of each other you know and they just didn't know what to do with it so i wrote it to google and i said hey check it out you know, look at this KML file, you totally can't deal with it. And they actually wrote back, you know, and they got into a conversation with them and they added a bunch of stuff to Google Earth because of it. It was kind of like crazy. Um, so that was, that was fun. So I kept working on projects like that and kept running into the same problem, which was when you're looking at data sets of species, the problem is the species names change over time, you know, and you know, you think like there's a book of all the species names. We know about 2 million species. They're estimated to be about 10 million species. There's no one book of all the species, right? Every group has their own like list of what the species are. And those names change over time. And if you have one data set from 1950 and one data set from 2020, and you're trying to merge them, you're gonna have a hard time because the names are different. You don't even know if you're talking about the same thing, if it has the same name, or maybe two things with different names are actually the same thing. You know, these changes are tracked over time in journals, right? And so it's really a pain. And this kept happening over and over and over again. And I got frustrated and I thought AI could solve this. And so I, so I decided to go back to grad school in computer science and solve this problem with AI. Uh, you know, and here's an example like birds, right? You've got this thing called the Anhinga melanogaster. It's the, also called the snake neck bird. The list of bird species is one, well, one of them is called Clements, book of bird species, I forget what it's called. Um, but it has multiple editions and every time a new edition comes out everybody switches to it but depending on what edition you use you're going to have different distributions of what this bird is right because in the fourth edition there were three subs uh, three species of anhinga and in the fifth edition 
they said, actually, three of these things are the same, you know, due to whatever research, genetic analysis, what, what have you. Now, all of a sudden, those are merged in the same thing. And so if you say, like, OK, what's an Anhinga melanogaster, you're going to get different results from one time to another, depending on, you know, what, key, what guide the people were using. So, you know, I used um, good old fashioned AI for that. I translated everything into first order predicate logic and sicked a bunch of reasoners on them um, and model fitters and came up with a pretty cool way of inferring things. So the idea is like, if you know some things about the relationships between these species, you know, can you infer, what can you infer? And then if you're trying to combine data sets with those species, you know, uh, how many different possible ways are there to combine these two data sets that are consistent with what you know? And what's the least information you need to be able to sort out the differences, right? So that's that's what my PhD was on. And it was, it was super fun. At the end of it, I needed to get a job. And I applied to a bunch of places. And in another random conversation with somebody who was like an organizer of a conference I was in, I was kind of talking about the progress I made on my job search. And he said, you should apply to Google. And I said, no, I don't want to apply to Google. I don't think there's anything there that interests me. And he said, ah, you might be surprised. So fine. So I got back from the conference and I, you know, had got rejected from the job I really wanted. And so I was super sad. And I said, fine, I'm going to apply to Google. And somehow the, my job application landed on the plate of the person at Google Earth who I'd been talking to about the broken ant set. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's like, hire this guy. <laughs> so I started working at Google. And, <laughs> yeah. And the thing I worked on initially at Google and for most of Google was this thing called Google Earth Engine. It's cloud-based geospatial analysis platform for large scale data. Um, but I worked with the team that built this. I helped build it and um, worked on a bunch of other stuff that was related like a project called Wildlife Insights, which I'm going to tell you a lot about. And that is where I met Sarah. Uh, I worked at Google for like eight years. It was great. Uh, and then I decided that I just wanted to focus on conservation 100%. I, I did a lot of that at Google. It was like a, you know, a blessing that I could do so much work. But you know, there was other stuff I was doing as well. And I thought, I just want to do a conservation. So luckily at that time, uh, this job that I have now opened up and I said, I want it. And I got it. And here I am at WWF. That's my path, um, which just goes to show two things. I think the main messages of that are, you know, talk to everybody that you possibly can, because you never know what will come up with, what will happen from it. Um, and, you know, nonlinear paths work out pretty well sometimes. All right. Now, to computer vision. So I'm at WWF. Our mission is to conserve nature and reduce the most pressing threats of diversity on, of life on Earth. Um, we focus on lots of different things. I'll go through it a little bit. Okay. Um, we're <laughs> active in almost 100 different countries. Um, like I said, there are about 7,000 people who work at the company. Um, they're distributed all over the place. And it's a federation, and so each office kind of acts independently. And then we just do a lot of like communicating back and forth to coordinate what we're doing. And the global science team, which I'm on, is one of the few that kind of spans the whole organization. Uh, and so we're doing data and technology um, with a kind of global focus. Uh, and we work with all of the different offices um, as much as we can. Um, the, we have these main areas of focus. Uh, wildlife is one of them, but there's also food, oceans, climate and energy, forest and freshwater, and we do lots of work in all of those things. And um, we're kind of organized, uh, we're looking at three different major crises that are happening now. Um, so one is climate change, so we do a lot into that. One is biodiversity loss, which is clearly in the wheelhouse of WWF. And then we also focus on food insecurity. So we do a lot of stuff with energy and food um, and other drivers of biodiversity loss. Um, and one of the ways we do that is with computer vision in myriad ways. And so I'm going to tell you about one of, I'm going to mostly be talking about Wildlife Insights, um, which is a project that uh, I helped start it, uh, 
while I was at Google. And then luckily when I switched over at WWF, WWF joined in. Um, and so we're doing a bunch of stuff uh, with it as well at WWF. Um, Dave, can you take a question right now? Oh, can you take a question? Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. So you don't see me in the camera because I'm a little bit to the side. Okay, now you will see me. That's Pietro. Um, I did. So uh, biodiversity or diversity is in your mission statement. So you must be deciding from time, uh, time and again which actions will improve or or at least. Um, decrease diversity. Do you have a definition of it and you know how to measure it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. LOL. So that yeah, you know yeah. at the end of the day whether you've made it back or worse. <laughs> that, you know, is a stupidly complicated question. Uh, it's, it's a great question. It's stupid that it's complicated. Um, so the definition of biodiversity often has three components. There, People talk about um, the diversity of communities, so how many different species in like an ecological niche. Uh, they talk about um, genetic diversity, like, you know, the diversity of actual genes. Um, and then they talk about diversity within species as well. And so we kind of look at all of them. We do, you know, eDNA for DNA measurements. Um, we look at population size uh, of different um, species at risk. We look at um, it's called beta diversity, which is like species richness. Um, we look at all of those and there's not one 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 thing that we we use. We track them all. If you look at so one of the big things that WWF does is this thing called the Living Planet Index. And they, every two years comes out the Living Planet Report. That's based on population size. It's tracking populations of species and when that's just one metric. So you can look at trends like that. You can look at trends in the population size. You can look at trends uh, for species richness, and we do we do all of those things. And then there's another one which is not biodiversity, but it's called ecosystem services. We do a lot of that too. So it's what you know is how's the air, how's the water, you know how's soil erosion, um, and we also do measurements like carbon. So biodiversity is one of the things we measure, and we kind of measure it in every possible way that we can. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. But it's one of those. Um, I mean, this is one of the things I spend a lot of time doing is like this question of indicators. Like, what are the indicators for measuring the health of ecosystems or habitats or populations? And there are so many indicators and they're all fit for certain purposes. So trying to figure out which indicator to use when um, is one of the fun things that keeps me busy all the time. All right. Thank you. Uh, so. Wildlife Insights. So Wildlife Insights is a project uh, for camera trap data aggregation um, and analysis. Um, you go to it from wildlifeinsights.org. Uh, the, you know, the idea is right now, you know, people do lots of these camera traps. They put them all over the place. They're collecting the data, but the data are generally siloed. Um, they, it's hard to get, you know, to see the world's, um, Camera trap data, you know, there are millions and millions of camera trap images, but they're all sitting on people's hard drives. So the idea with Wildlife Insights was to make those data available and also to make it easier to uh, collect, analyze, and share them. Um, so it has a, an AI, uh, artificial bleh, AI component, um, which uh, Google has been working on. They've been doing the AI modeling. Uh, and then there's a bunch of cloud stuff infrastructure to support this um, ease of sharing and analyzing. Um, and it's all in Wildlife Insights. And I think maybe the, one of the big themes of this talk is just when you're developing a model, where does it go? You know, what, what happens? You're sitting there building a computer model, but what does it take to actually make that impactful? Um, so I, I'm gonna go into that a little bit here. Um, let's see. Yep. So this is kind of what I just said, lots of images, um, but they're, it's hard to share them. And it, it's also time consuming to label them, uh, where it's just where the AI comes in. There are lots of people involved, um, many NGOs. Uh, this kind of started out of Conservation International who had a earlier project called TEAM. And so it was a kind of an extension of that, but then all these other organizations that also had camera trap data uh, joined in. 
Uh, and so with Wildlife Insights, you can upload your data, you can run the computer vision model, and then there are analyses you can do uh, that are coming. This project has been going for about four years now, and the analysis components are scheduled to come online pretty soon. Behind the scenes, you can do analyses, they're not, but there's no sort of user interface for that. So that's that's coming soon. Google got into it because they were doing a lot of machine learning and they had <laughs> this great background in uh, you know, running machine learning on their own stuff. And so there was a paper that came out in 2012. It was Jeff Dean. It was one of the first Google, I think it was the first Google machine learning paper where they just did unsupervised classification on YouTube videos. So they took a bunch of frames from YouTube videos and they ran unclassified learning uh, algorithm on it and just said, what do you got? And what they came up with were cats, lots, lots and lots of cats. And if you looked at like some of the top layers of the network, you got, you saw this thing. This is, <laughs> this is your typical, you know, YouTube cat. Beautiful, <laughs> right? So, you know, when the idea of helping out with this thing where there are real cats and you're trying to find them came along, Google is very excited because they already know a lot about cats and machine learning. Right. <laughs> um, so it's going great. There, are, it's um, there are almost a thousand species that uh, it's pretty accurate at. Um, there are fifteen million camera trap images in the data set. Uh, lots of users. Um, one of the things that it's really useful for is getting rid of, rid of blanks. So Im images that don't have any animals in them. Either it's like a leaf blew across the camera and it took a picture of it, or some wind blew the grass or something like that. In some data sets, it's like 90% of the images are like that. And so you're a poor scientist and you're saying, you know, next, 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 you know, very boring. Um, so it's, it's pretty good at, at detecting the blanks. Um, yeah, it gets about 80% of the blanks with a pretty good error rate. Um, yeah, and usually when, if there is a thing in an image, if it's incorrectly labeling something as a blank, often there are images either right before or right after where you actually see the animal. So even in the case where, um, you know, maybe there's a false positive for a blank, um, you'll still catch whatever it is um, since camera traps take multiple pictures in series. Uh, yep, and in the, in the top most common species, the um, models are between 80 and 90% correct. Um, the main thing this is good for is speeding up the process of identification. Um, people using it report like five times speed ups of what they're, what they're doing. Uh, and let's see, so I'll go through a little bit, a couple of the features of this thing, showing you where the AI is embedded. And then I'll talk a little bit about how it works. And then one big project that we're using it on to give you a sense for how it's being used in the field. Um, all right, so it's got this AI thing, right? It's it's using, I think last I heard it was using efficient net. Um, yeah, and they just have a big corpus of images that they're constantly training it up on. Um, and it has a, you know, a bounding box detector uh, in there to, to, to help improve the um, accuracy. It's mega detector. <laughs> mega detector, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you, it's got a bunch of data management stuff. So uploading, um, sorting, filtering, downloading, all this stuff is built in. Um, a lot of our users don't have internet access. So there's a desktop version in the works. Um, there is sharing built in, which is super useful because if you have pictures of endangered species, you don't want them up publicly, but you know, in some contexts, you might wanna share them with people that you trust. Uh, so there's sharing capacity built in there. And all this stuff is like built around the model to make it most useful for the community. 
Um, yeah. Uh, oh, you can embargo data. So if you're working on a publication and you don't want everybody to see the data you have before your publication is live, you can embargo the data for a while. Useful. Uh, oh yeah, here's the thing I was telling you where you can you, people can request data from you. So you can say, hey, I know you're working on Panthers or whatever. Can you know? Would you be willing to talk to me about the data that you have? So there's a little social networking inside the app. Um, and then there are analytics. So there are basic analytics, just like on your project, how many images have you uploaded? How many camera traps do you have? How are they deployed? What are the species? Like basic stuff like that. Um, and then in the works are things like um, activity analytics, um, uh, occupancy, um, other kinds of um, data useful for understanding what's happening with your whole deployment. So for instance, here's uh, activity overlap between two species over time, a red wolf and raccoons, right? So you can see, you know, when they might be, you know, having uh, relationships of various kinds. Um, these, uh, yeah, and there are lots of other analytics that are coming up online, and I'll, I'll show you some more in a little bit. Uh, there are currently, yeah, this is pretty recent, uh, 43 million records in there, and they are very well distributed. Um, this is very exciting. And you can just go and look at them at wildlifeinsights.org. All right, so I'll tell you a little bit about the model. Um, it combines mega detector um, with vision net. Um, there's this, it's a, um, there's basic decision tree that happens. So the detector and the classifier run, um, it looks for blanks. If it's confident that it's a blank, it says, yeah, it's a blank. If it's confident of the species, then it looks in this kind of, I don't know, a geofencing table, which, I worked on and it could be improved, but it kind of says like, hey, are you seeing an elephant in downtown Detroit? You know, maybe that's not exactly what you're thinking about when you're thinking about where elephants are. Um, so it kind of, you know, will flag things if they're in places where you don't expect them to be. Uh, and then if it's confident and it thinks it's where it is, it'll tell you what it is and it can, um, kind of go to the species level or you can go up higher taxonomic levels depending on the, the confidence um, and whether or not it's in the geo referencing, uh, the geo fencing table. Um, and then in the case of no confidence, it just says no confidence. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, with, with this kind of ensemble method of using mega detector with the classifier, it's good at catching blanks and, and unexpected humans. Um, yeah. So actually interesting story about that. The old model yeah. that didn't have a detector um, kept categorizing humans that were close to the camera like this as blanks. And the reason for that was that in the training data, when ecologists were um, labeling their data, they would take the images of them setting up the camera at the beginning and not label it as human, they would label it as blank. But they wouldn't take those away. And so there was all of these images of people really close to cameras that were labeled by the ecologists as being blank. And so the model basically learned that that was a blank. Wow. So clean up your labeled data. <laughs> yep, yep, definitely. It's like the tank detector that somehow was able to detect tanks and then they found out that it was because all the images that didn't have tanks were taken later in the day <laughs> okay so some more things like the one in the upper left there's a person i think way in the back um sometimes the animals are just really small and it does not so well on very small animals um yeah some let's see Oh, this is what I mentioned before. Sometimes if it counts as a blank, there'll be other examples of it in nearby images. So, you know, on the one on the left, you can't really, well, it says that it's a mammal. It totally missed, the model misses the one in the middle, but the one just a little bit later it identifies correctly. Um, yeah. Uh, and sometimes, 
when it labels as blank, it's not really all that great anyway. So you can see on the left-hand side, there's like an image of this tail on the tree, um, which, okay, that's great. The human, some genius look, knows what kind of squirrel is based on the, the tail, that's great. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's not that great of an image. All right, so you can, so let's see. Yeah, so here's this, evidence of the, the smaller the species, the harder to identify, like it's pretty good at finding it out what an elk is, you know, it's, it's got good elk results. But if you look at like ruined or this spotted tohi, it's, it's, there aren't that many images, first of all, and they're small. Um, yeah. All right, so just some overview of the results. Um, it speed this whole process speed things up because first you get rid of the blanks. If you're confident that you don't want to look at the blanks in many data sets, you can just get rid of them. And that gets rid of an awful lot of the data. When it sorts out animals, it's pretty easy to just go through and just verify, you know, that it was correct and change it if it, if it wasn't, but you don't have to enter it by hand. Um, the ones that take a long time are the ones with no results because you don't really know exactly what it is. If it's not, if there's something in there, and it can't identify it, then that can take a little bit of time. Um, but overall, it's really speed. It's the, the, the AI has been speeding things up an awful lot. There was one example of a professor who deployed a bunch of cameras. They had 300,000 images. They got 30 students to label them, and it took an hour or something like that after running it through the model. Um, so yeah, people are really getting uh, experiencing a speed up from this. Uh, and if you go to this site and you go to wildlifeinsights.org about wildlife insights AI, you can actually go species by species and see what the accuracy is. It, it'll give you both the precision and the recall I mean, the number of images of that, of that species in the data set. Uh, and you know, that's useful for places where there haven't been a lot of camera trap data. There's not been a lot of camera trap data uploaded in the first place. So like we, I'm gonna talk about this thing in Australia. Um, it was a huge project in Australia, but before, this Australia project, there weren't a lot of Australian data in the system. And so, you know, it didn't know what a kangaroo was. Um, so you can kind of go in here and, and try things out to see if the, if it's if you can expect it to perform well. Uh, Dave, may I yeah. ask you a question? Yeah. When you tune the system, you can trade off different types of errors. And you may do so even across different species. My intuition is that uh, Missing a common animal, uh, it could be a raccoon, may not be a huge cost for the researchers. But there may be some rare sightings that are truly valuable, and you don't want to miss them. How do you? What kind of knobs do you give to the user to be able to trade off or to specify the cost of missing something, and how do they know that um, this target is achieved in some way? Yeah, okay. So we don't provide any knobs to the user for that. The it's um done in the in the training. And one thing that we do is cap the number of super common species in the training data set. So like the number one most common thing in the training data are cows. Like I forget what it is, like half or something like that. Some huge number of the images are cows. So we don't have a lot of cows in the training data set, right? We reduce them. Um, I think that's a that's the primary way I know of. I don't know, Sarah, do you have other ways, other information? Yeah, we use some of these techniques that Benny was talking about this morning to deal with imbalanced data. Um, so yeah. we will like upweight um, the consequences for mispredicting a rare species. Um, and then, uh, basically for species that are very rare that we know we're not performing well on, um, we just like, we don't, um, there's only like the only species that we will confidently predict in the model are ones that we know that we sort of trust. And that trust is built with like a pretty complicated process of trying to build a gold standard data set that covers all the different ecosystems that people might be interested in. And that is constantly changing as new users come in. Um, and so the, the one really important caveat with even looking up the accuracy on a table like this is that it's based on evaluation sets that we are holding out locations, but still you, we don't have the accuracy numbers for your region 
for a given species necessarily, right? So if you're coming in from, from Australia and you didn't have enough training data in Australia before, like you, you could say like, oh, what's the accuracy on some sort of like domestic cat? And maybe it would be that good in Australia, but we can't make any guarantees because we don't know. So building the test sets for this model is just like a constant and incredibly complicated process. And your point about uh, letting the users tune knobs, I think that's really important because for any given end user, for their species of interest or for their ecological project, like they have different risks of missed predictions versus not. Um, and we've discussed a lot the trade-off between letting people tune the model themselves or letting people use different models for their each project, which then encodes some bias based on that model or based on the choices they make for their own decisions. And then you get IDs, but now we're looking at doing global analytics. And so if different users are using different models or different users are using different confidence thresholds for different models, potentially then the analytics will be biased in really subtle ways. And we still don't really know exactly what the answer is there. Yeah. I am a wildlife, I am a user. Mm -hmm. So, and also my project is just with the real links. So I really know what are the, I created my, my own material conclusion. So I really know where the, where the AI is saying to me that it's a canine, maybe it's a link. So mm -hmm. it's like, and also it's like, the. Uh, Wildlife Insight have a really good uh, in, uh, user interface, mm -hmm. so I can I can create my own filter and say only show me the images that the ER predict as canid as and, and with that I only go to review some of them that for sure are are where the links are. Yeah. Uh, and that's another important point, which is we do not use uh, data that's only been labeled by computer vision in analytics because of stuff like this. Uh, yeah. That different users will correct and verify only the things they're interested in, but we don't necessarily know that the model predictions for the other images are correct or not. It's complicated. Yeah. yeah. And also, How we track those. Um, you know, when somebody goes in and changes the decision of the AI, we track it so that we can know, you know, what's been overridden. It's also a really nice way to get targeted training data because you're getting explicitly data where your models got made a mistake and now you're adding that to training so it will hopefully not make that same mistake in the future. Um, presumably, I'm assuming the majority of the training data is terrestrial camera traps or terrestrial images. Um, do you, is there any like, yeah, knob tuning voodoo magic that like accounts for what's well, probably a big discretion between the number of like terrestrial images that are in the training data set. You mean versus underwater? No, like terrestrial versus arboreal. Oh yeah. Um, so arboreal camera traps are super hard. Um, you don't actually do any explicit reweighting of different types of camera traps. Um, and one thing that we did this a lot with mega detector, just as a separate thing, it's like that, just check if it works for you first. I think that that is what I recommend people do with any machine learning model. So if you have arboreal camera traps, upload a hundred images and look at the results. And if they're garbage, then this isn't ready for you yet. Um, but I think there's definitely a bias against arboreal camera traps because of the bias in the training data. And I don't think that's gonna get fixed until a lot of people ingest their training data. So it's a bit chicken and egg because if it's not working for you, that's not worth using it. Not worth using it, then we don't get the training data to make it work. So. Yeah, I guess it like you could how they put a geofence around stuff. You could almost like geofence like, oh well, this arboreal animal like you shouldn't detect it if it's on mm -hmm. a terrestrial camera trap. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. You're not gonna, you know, if it's if if it thinks a howler monkey is on the ground, like something is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that gets to like when we were trying to do the geofencing, we were debating whether to do it in a kind of statistical way or do it in kind of a more brain dead way, which is what we did, which is basically <laughs> just looking at GBIF and seeing you know the global biodiversity information facility and seeing like what species were where. But there is, you know, you could use a, you know, you could use machine learning to figure this thing, you know, this out and add priors based on statistical 
analysis, which is you know long, I think, in our planning, but I don't think it's it's being done. Eli right. works on this, and so Eli and I have been talking about this for about two and a half years. One day we'll yeah. actually. <laughs> All right, so I've got about well, I don't know, not much longer. So let me go real quick through this one case study. Um, this is work. Uh, Abby Himmeyer and Arno Liet and Emma Spencer are the ones who did this work. So I'm just presenting their stuff. This is this Australia project I told you uh, mentioned. Um, the issue is that there was a huge number, a huge bunch of fires in Australia in 2019 to 2020. Um, you know, it burned the area the size of like Nebraska or Washington state um, in Australia. Three billion animals were impacted. And they, there was this interest in figuring out like what recovery looked like. And, you know, what do we know about how species recover from fire? And also what do we know about just the impacts of the fire in the first place? Um, so a bunch of organizations were brought together uh, to deploy camera traps and use wildlife insights to collect the, the data. Um, so it was 18 different partners, over a thousand camera traps, 3 million images in a very short amount of time. And so just the upload process of the images given internet restrictions was one of the main uh, challenges, it was just like just the speed of moving the bits across a wire to get to the, you know, the training, the, you know, the repository. Um, there were certain target species um, that were identified um, and an awful lot of users. Um, and the things that people mostly were interested in were is first establishing baselines, like what's the situation now after the fire, um, and also trying to figure out um, you know, what kinds of interventions were, were useful and to help sort of prioritize um, where they ought to put in more sort of recovery uh, efforts. Um, so here are some of the organizations, lots of um, universities, um, and also community groups. And so another kind of nice effect of this tool is the ability to engage communities because now they can actually see the, they can go to the web and see the you know result of the camera trapping, whereas prior it was the data were not easily available. Um, so projects all over the um, east coast of um, west coast of Australia, uh, and yeah, looking at um, the like kangaroos, wallabies, possums, all kinds of different um, species, and trying to see you know how they're doing in various areas that have been burned to different degrees. Uh, um, let's see. Oh, another question was, um, you know, how the, whether the um, overlapping of species has changed at all, depending on the degree of uh, burn. So questions about how, how the community of species has been affected as well as specific species. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, so there's this, um, little guy here, the Dunart, the kangaroo ion Dunart. So one question is, what was the impact on those um, and getting baselines for where they exist? And it turns out that they exist in lots of different places, which is discovered by the trapping. Um, and here's some of the images. They're super cute. <laughs> we got some koalas. We got some wombats. We got a wallaby. Um, there's a possum. Uh, Goana, I think, is number six. Uh, Bandicoot is number seven. Echidna, number nine. And a feral cat. Um, <laughs> that was, you know, high confidence on the feral cat. <laughs> uh, right. So the users respond, they, they, say, they gave us the number of five, five times increase in processing speed, um, 500 hours per project saved. Um, using this model, um, so it's been pretty effective. Um, and uh, yeah, here's a bunch of the different kinds of species they identified um, with the different levels of precision and their um, how endangered they were. Uh, they had to develop a whole separate training set data set since there weren't Australian species prior, so that took a lot of work as well. Um, 
and um, to support the data analysis, because that part of the platform has not yet been released, um, a tool was developed in our um, within our shiny uh, to help with uh, analyzing the data. Um, so it tells you um, in the different. So green is relatively unburned. Purple is you know very high fire severity. You know it tells you you know, breaks up the different species and images based on the severity of the burn. Um, and you can do these, um, these uh, accumulation curves to see in the different kinds of uh, environments, burnt to lesser burnt, how many species um, were observed. Um, so that's a nice analysis. Um, and you can compare different times. So the <coughs> But on the left is a more recent time than on the right. Uh, you can see that their detection rates have gone up. Um, you can, you know, look at different uh, environments to see what the, you know, the impact has been over time and what the recovery has been like uh, on a per species basis. And one last thing is this um, activity pattern. So this is a swamp wallaby. Um, you can look at the how its um, behavior changes over time based on uh, the condition of the land that they're in. Um, so you can see that there's something going on in highly burnt areas where there's a little bit of a shift in the activity of this wallaby. Um, so this so. The model is embedded in this Wildlife Insights thing, which gives lots of additional features. And then Wildlife Insights itself is being embedded in this thing called Wild Ops, um, which is a larger system supported by the Australian government uh, to do the whole chain of, um, you know, how do you deploy camera traps and collect metadata about those, identify the results of the camera traps, and then how do you combine the data and share it in a national database? And so this is in development now, this wild obs thing. So it's, it shows like where, you know, you've got your model, but it gets embedded in many different layers to meet many different audiences. So that's it for um, Australia and for Wildlife Insights. I'm just gonna run through real quick a couple of other examples and then I have a little bit of time for more questions. Um, so here's some other places that we're doing computer vision. Um, one is where, uh, we're using Wildlife Insights for this one too. This is the Amazon Sustainable Landscapes Project. So this is deployment in three different countries um, to look at things like connectivity. Um, and one of the and one of the uh, big discoveries here was uh, community involvement. So the use of Wildlife Insights in these areas uh, was really useful for the local communities who live in the area to see, you know what was happening in their in their land. They were really, really interested in it. Um, and capacity building is a, like a critical part of our mission. Uh, um, so it's been great to be able to use uh, computer vision in, in that capacity. Um, we're doing some work uh, with Duke um, and a couple other organizations on counting humpback whales with drones. So that's a great project. Um, and there's a bunch of work we're doing with trying to end illegal wildlife trade online. There's a thing called the Coalition to End Wildlife Trafficking Online, which is a bunch of companies, um, you know, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they're all in on it. Um, and computer vision models have been used to try to identify products uh, that should be flagged as potentially uh, illegally traded. Um, and so Pangolin is one of the ones where the pangolins are getting just destroyed by trade for lots of reasons, for medicine, for um, clothing, you know, and so uh, there's a great effort to focus on pangolins um, with Microsoft uh, to, to use computer vision to catch trade. Um, and then in a similar example, oh, there's also an example of using a similar thing in airports with the x-ray machines and identifying animal parts that are shouldn't you know that are being illegally traded there um, i think the last example is this one in um, zambia where there's a park they're monitoring boats and previously then they've always used um infrared cameras 
for this, but the infrared cameras, there were lots of um, false positives. And so they're using machine learning uh, computer vision to reduce the number of false positives. Um, so don't flag waves and birds, you know, they only get the, the boats. So to conclude, um, we're using computer vision all over the place at WWF to do all kinds of different things. Um, one of the things that I'm real excited about in the future moving forward is uh, trying to figure out how to integrate that with other sensors. So we also do a lot of bioacoustics where we're doing eDNA. Um, we do a lot of satellite imagery analysis using machine learning. And how do you combine all those things to get kind of a global picture of what's going on in a spot? And is there a way to, be used, to use machine learning and AI to help synthesize those data? Um, we have some prediction systems. So we have a system that we worked on to help predict de likely deforestation six to 12 months out. Um, and they're planning systems uh, for things like patrols of protected areas, but integrating, you know, doing more of that um, is something that we're working towards. And then another thing I'm looking at is causal reasoning. Like, can you, like given a intervention, like if we do something like a restoration intervention, can, can we measure the causation, like if, if species are, if populations are improving, can we say why? Um, and given all the work that we do, can we show, you know, that the, you know, how much of the end result is due to what we're, we're doing? And can also, can you extract causal relationships that may not be easily apparent in data? So that's another aspect of AI and machine learning in our work. Ah, one final thing. Uh, one good lens to look at if you're thinking about sort of AI for good is the sustainable development goals. The ones that we focus a lot on are life below water and life on land. Um, there's some really cool papers that if you haven't seen them, you should check them out. There's a McKinsey use case of AI for SDGs and life on land is one of the major ones where they found a lot of use cases. Life below water, not so much. Um, so if you're looking for something to break into, there's a lot of ground to be broken there. Uh, and then there's this nice paper from Nature Communications talking about the where AI can have positive and negative impacts. Um, and uh, 15 and 14 are the ones, well, there's an environment section up in the upper left corner of this circle. And you can see there are lots of positives, not a lot of negatives. Um, and this paper has a lot of uh, other use cases you can look at that are really interesting. With that, I'll finish up. Thanks so much. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, um, yeah, Carly. Hi. Um, thank you so much for that. That was fascinating. I'm pretty sure I've probably asked you the same question in like a wild labs chat or something. Um, but like, how far away are we from like wildlife insights for acoustics? Like, yeah, in not... my lifetime, <laughs> <laughs> theoretically. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. The backlog is pretty long. Like we're just getting the athletes <laughs> up now. I mean, there's a big interest in it for sure. And we've definitely been talking to people. And I just recently, oh yeah, I was just recently going around WWF collecting all the bioacoustics examples that I know I could find that we're doing. So there's, I don't know what the timeline is, but there's definitely a big interest in it. It's hard though. Bioacoustics is hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard I am well aware. <laughs> way harder i mean it's really and then yeah so it's it's a big it's a big problem so, um <clears throat> yeah so like i think most people here would probably consider themselves like to some extent more scientists and people working on analytical problems than like people working on large scale large scale like tools that are Going to be like very public facing and i'm curious um you know between something like herb engine and wildlife insights like just what the what were the biggest challenges and like value judgments that you and your teams have had to make when thinking about these like global products that you know you're thinking about like the the end users like your your mission protecting wilderness and nature but then you're also thinking about like these local people and populations that like these products actually affect so just yeah i'm curious if you could talk about that 
Well, let's see, a couple, a couple of parts of, or aspects to that question. So, um, well, you know, one, one thing that you just remind me of is when we were working on Earth Engine, there was an early decision to focus on one, one topic, right? And to really get that right. So, and it was, it was deforestation. So when Earth Engine first came out and we launched in 2010, all of our examples were around uh, forest deforestation or forest degradation of some sort. And um, we, in given that focus, we were able to really reach out to the experts in the field and make sure we were building something that they could use. And we brought people on board to actually develop stuff in the platform you know, before we even launched it. And I think that was a good decision, right? Because then we weren't solving everybody's problems for everything and that would have been hard. So having this one domain and then working, you know, broadening out from that to, to all the stuff it's doing now was I think a, a good choice. And, in term, and then going to your um, question about wildlife and communities, it is a great question. Um, one thing that I kind of knew before I started WWF, but I don't think I fully appreciated was how important people are to conservation. Like almost everything that we do is really like focused on people, right? And and you know, when we're looking at uh, species that we're interested in conserving, when we're looking at habitats we want to restore or protect, um, the, the people there are of critical importance. Um, and so everything we do goes through a lot of screening to um, measure the impact on local communities. We're always working hard to involve local communities and build things for those local communities. That's one of the really exciting things that came out of, came out of this, um, well, the uh, Amazon thing I told you about and the Australia one is the, the, the tool as a tool for engagement of the local communities and a way of capacity building and hopefully handing things off to those communities so that they can monitor their own land for their own purposes. Like that's one of our, that's a major goal. Um, and it, across everything we do, the, the focus on uh, communities and people who are living on the land that, and around the species um, that, that we talk about, um, you know, their, their needs are, are like, are uh, paramount. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, Jeff, you want to Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, as the ant person in the room, I have to ask how you got a species named after you. Like I saw that you have a species. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah, I have a, a species from uh, uh, Cameroon, the Plectrothena thawi. Uh, that was <laughs> out of ant web. That was like a one of the people who I worked with on that. He ran out of other people to name ants after. So we, he just chose me. There was nobody left. You're not allowed to name things after yourself, right? So, you know, it's like, ah, okay, I'll give one to this guy. <laughs> it came out of ant web. Um, it's a cool species, though. It's a loner species. It's like one of the most loner ant species that I've ever had. <laughs> Which I guess I can, I, can, I, can, I, I, you know, I can identify with it. Uh, it also eats caterpillars, it like rips them apart. I don't know. <laughs> that part. Or centipede. Centipede. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Question? I have a question for you, David. Yeah. Um, so wildlife insights and things like it can be really sort of scalable and impactful and sort of like going off of what Ethan's saying, like really are very broad in scope. Um but obviously also require a huge amount of like resources and, and infrastructure and investment. And I guess, you know, every single person in this room is an ecologist that is working on a specific problem that's working on, you know, models to help them solve those problems. But how, what advice would you have for them about the right ways to start scaling up if they do get really good results? Like what's the, what's the sustainable way for an interdisciplinary ecologist who has a model? To get into the hands of others. Yeah, so having um, a road to impact, I think, is a good is a good way. Like it's the partnerships you build, uh, and whether or not they are making decisions based around what you're doing, and maybe getting clarity on that before you start doing a lot of work, I think, is key. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of tools that are built for conservation organizations to answer their own questions. Um, which are useful 
uh, but it's like partnerships with groups that are working on the ground in governments and local communities, uh, you know, and government. Yeah, but I think that's that's probably the one of the best ways to scale. And I've worked on this other project, which is um, climate adaptation planning tool. You know, and there it's really like which organizations are interested in using it that drives what we what we do with it. And if there's not an end user ready to make decisions based on whatever it is, then we deprioritize that whatever, you know, that thing. So I think, you know, and once you, if you can find that user base who are committed to using what you're developing, um, then other things like funding support and just visibility come from that. But it's really having the end user like, already have a good sense for who that is and having them on board while you're developing it, that that helps. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, it's valid to be your own end user, right? I mean, if you're like doing research and this thing is a means to an end for your own research and you are your end user, then that's also a very reasonable way to think about yeah. it. Yeah, um, yeah, but if you're looking for um, operational, so uh, most of what I do is operationalizing. So I'm I'm operationalizing different forms of science, and if that's what you're doing, then having the end user is critical. Yeah. You know, if you're not trying to operationalize it and you're you're doing the research to figure out how something works so that later it can be developed into something that has application, then yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah, I guess one more question. Um, yeah, so I'm curious. Uh, in the you, you mentioned um, how important it is to have community engagement in all the projects that you're working on. Um, I guess, like, what is your take on WWF's, um, you know, like, understanding of, you know, who to partner with in the community? Because there are so many, especially in conservation, there are so many, um, you know, different players with very different interests. How do you see, you know, how do you basically go into a new project and decide who to collaborate with? Uh, okay, so one of the strengths of WWF is that we're active in all those different countries, right? And we have relationships with um, NGOs in those countries. There are already relationships with communities in those countries um, and, um, you know, with governments as well. So those, and as I mentioned, like right up front, WWF is a federation. So each office acts independently and is focused on the needs of the country that they're operating in. Um, and so there's not a lot of like, the U.S. says that in Myanmar you ought to be doing this. Like, no, the people in Myanmar decide what they got, what the most important thing is based on their their experience in country. So, when it comes down to deciding which communities to work with or who in the community to work with, it's super complicated, right? I mean, it's enormous questions about you know who about trust and um, authority and power relationships and ah, I mean, it's 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 a big issue. Uh, and those those questions are addressed like by the country offices. So it depends case by case. There's no one universal answer other than to say that we have this sort of set of safeguards that we have in place to ensure that whatever we're doing, there are mechanisms for community members to, um, to air issues that they're experiencing, right? So one of the things that we've been doing a lot of is ensuring that those lines of communication are open to entire communities whenever we're doing any um, work with them or in the area. Thanks again so much, Dave. This has been really, really useful and informative. Um, yeah, let's... All right. Great. So thanks y'all for, for being here and listening and taking the class. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for the invitation. It's been great. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye.